Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion, Unlocking Category Management Best Practices for an E-Commerce-Driven World. My name is Rob Lunder from the Edge by Essential Marketing Department, and we're very excited today to be joined by Leslie Warshaw, President for the Category Management and Shopper Insights Association, Danny Silverman, Chief Marketing Officer for Edge, and Chris Perry, VP for Global Executive Education at Edge. I will share their backgrounds momentarily. Uh, really quickly, today is a panel discussion where I will ask Leslie, Danny, and Chris a series of questions to gain their insights into key industry issues. All participants are on mute for the call, but if you have any questions, you can ask them by entering them into the Q&A box. We'll make sure to do our best to get to all of your questions. Uh, and if we're unable to, uh, due to time constraints, we'll make sure to follow up with you immediately after the webcast. Today's webcast is brought to you by Edge by Essential, formerly Brandview, Clavis Insight, One Click Retail, and Planet Retail RNG. Our four companies have joined forces under Essential PLC with a shared vision to empower brands and retailers with the most comprehensive, accurate, and actionable insights in advisory solutions to grow revenue in an e-commerce driven marketplace. We partner globally with the world's leading brands and retailers to identify strategies and to provide weekly, daily, and real-time digital shelf performance KPIs, including pricing, promotions, availability, traffic, conversion, sales, and share. You can learn more by visiting essentialedge.com. I'd now, like a, I'd now like to turn it over to Leslie, who will share with everybody a little bit more about the Category Management and Shopper Insights Association. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I, um, I work with the uh, Shopper Insights Management Association and the Category Management Association as well. We're all about um, uh, being, being a professional association that's dedicated to serving our members in the industry. Um, the Category Management Association has been around for over 14 years, and we have over 230 companies that are member companies with us, and we interact on a regular basis with thousands of folks in the industry. Um, we started Shopper Insights Management Association, as we saw a need in the industry, to work collaborati collaboratively across the functions. And it's really all about how um, brands can adapt and re retailers can adapt to the ever-changing consumer and shopper habits and priorities. You can go to the next slide. So really, we thought about what was needed, and it was, um, you know, a new way of driving business. We we want to bring together leadership in the community to deliver to deliver integrated best practices, and really make sure that everybody has a foundational understanding of the shopper, as well as uh, advanced learning. Um, the association exists to help develop integrated solutions between category management, shopper insights, shopper marketing, sales, store operations, and more. Um, we bring these functions together to, to provide the industry with enormous benefits for driving brand and basket growth. Go to the next slide. Uh, I'll go really quickly through the value components of, of a membership uh, to Category Management Association and Shopper Insights Management Association. It's really about staying connected. We do tons of webinars, newsletters. Um, we have a best practices uh, component where we help our members to solve for their key business issues. We have training and certification in category management and are going to be launching Shopper Insights training um, very shortly. We work with universities and uh, career development, and we also have conferences every year that we um, bring together thought leadership. Thank you, Leslie. As you just heard, uh, Leslie is currently president of the Shopper Insights and Management Association, where she is responsible for overseeing all of the organization's activities, including membership, publications, training, and best practices. Um, previously, Leslie had the CPG practice at Rakuten Intelligence, uh, a source for data and analytics around the online shopper. Uh, before that, she was global senior VP of product development at Kantar, responsible for product development, marketing, and sales of custom panels custom online market research communities. Uh, also on the call today, we have Danny Silverman. Danny is our chief marketing officer uh, here at Edge. He is an established industry thought leader with over 14 years of experience helping brands grow their online presence and sales. He spent eight of those years at Johnson & Johnson where he led their e-commerce strategy. And last but not least, uh, we have on the call today, Chris Perry. 
uh, who's our VP for Global Executive Education at EDGE, and is on a mission to help empower leaders of change, both people and organizations, to become better at what they do so that they make the positive impact to which they ultimately aspire. Over his career to date, as an FMCG e-commerce practitioner, he has led the e-commerce strategy, organization, capabilities, and activation across Reckitt, Benkiser, Wellpet, and Kellogg's. So moving forward uh, for today's presentation and today's panel, uh, the first question we have, why should we as brands and retailers care about e-commerce? And Leslie, I will turn that over uh, to you to get us started. Yeah, thanks. Um, when I think about the importance of e-commerce, I mean, we're going to talk um, shortly here about the growth opportunity. That sort of goes without saying. I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, most of the growth for brands that we see today is coming from the online space. But when I think about the importance of the e-commerce insights, it's more than just um, the opportunity for growth. It really also has to do with the fact that almost every shopper is online. So you need to understand the shopper, which means you need to understand the shopper online as well as offline. There's almost no omni shopper anymore because everybody is an omni shopper. Um, you can't understand the shopper unless you know what they do online as a whole person. So it's really about humanizing the insights. We, we can't forget that the data that we're working with brings us to insights about human beings. And that means that they are a whole person online and offline. Uh, marketing to the shopper is multidimensional. So we need to uh, consider the online behavior as well as the offline behavior when we're thinking about our marketing plans. Um, online search, for example, is is really information gathering, even for brick and mortar purchases. So again, there's a holistic view. And then the other piece is that trend spotting is is really um, a lot of what happens, new trends that we see early adopters happens online first. So we can use online behavior as a way to understand new trends. Um, so really, online is critical to all brands, regardless of the proportion of their business that is on, sold online. Um, it's still a critical uh, piece to understand. Great. Thanks, Leslie. And just to pick up on um, one of those key points, too, in terms of focusing on e-commerce, obviously, it's uh, one of the fastest growing channels. Um, and we wanted to include some data here on latest projections in that area where we're looking at over 13 percent compounded annual growth over the next five years. Um, globally, e-commerce continues to pick up pace and continues to disrupt all of retail. And while store based retail will always have a role and be critical. Um, and even be the output or the, the conversion point of the online interaction, um, that the growth of actual online sales continues to grow and accelerate around the world and um, creates a very compelling data point for brands and retailers who want to make sure that they are uh, focusing the, the fair share or more than fair share um, on the channels that are growing fastest. And, you know, and ultimately, while we know e-commerce still, for many categories, is still a single digit percent share of total retail sales, um, but for some categories has already progressed to a much, much higher, more meaningful level. The, the reality is we can't look at just that percentage of sales as, as, as a true in, indicator of, of behavior and influence. And I think we all know that digital in its macro definition, whether through desktop or mobile technology and or budding technologies, is, is ultimately influencing a much greater share of sales. And that's already been proven, measured, and forecasted to grow over the next several years. But I mean, that's very indicative in a couple key facts. You know, ultimately, multiple surveys and research studies have shown that Amazon specifically is outperforming the Googles of the world in on in, in online product search engine leadership. And so people are naturally going to Amazon specifically to find what products exist. Um, you know, obviously general price points, reviews, content, more information about them. But but then even if they're not on Amazon, they're starting on Google looking up solutions and often e-commerce retailers, Amazon, Walmart, et cetera, and other global retailers show up quite high in those search engines from a rank perspective and ultimately deliver on, on that search query with a solution, whether or not it's actually procured online versus offline. And then also, you know, what's, what's been really interesting to see 
as, as a brand practitioner myself, but also at Edge with a lot of our clients is how many digitally native brands are truly launching themselves at a national level on par with a lot of the traditional leaders in their categories, but having started online um, as, as their, their channel of choice. And, you know, when you think of buy beverages, you know, which had been purchased by Dr. Pepper um, prior to the Keurig acquisition and merger, um, you know, they actually started online and, and leveraged Amazon and e-commerce retail to drive their business to the level of, of popularity and, and leadership that they have today. Um, we can even look at other brands that al also started with their own direct to consumer platforms like Harry's or Dollar Shave Club, um, who ultimately have, have stolen a lot of market share and really become major brands within the category, but again, leveraged an equalized online playing field to influence the broader marketplace. So it, the, the, the key here is that influence it often leads be, and, and, and the sales often follow, um, but, but that influence is gonna become more, more and more important over time. And we actually talked about that a little bit later in today's session. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the next question. Thanks, Chris. Yes, the next question. So how is online category management different than in-store category management? Leslie, do you wanna kick us off there? Sure, sure, thanks. Um, so when we think about category management, and I kind of put this chart together to address the question, um, we think about the different processes and um, uh, the different elements of category management. And the first one is uh, that I've highlighted is process. And there is a very specific category management process that most uh, in the industry uh, have adopted, and that is our Catman 2.0 process. And it's very specific. Um, for category management and really online is very uh, much a work in progress in terms of Catman. Uh, there's just a lot of variety of um, a lot of opportunity, a variety of approaches. So it's just very much a work in progress right now. Um, and a lot of these differences as I go through this chart, um, one of the things to think about is the overarching difference between uh, online and in store is really for online, there's so much flexibility, so much choice, so much um, ability for personalization. Um, those are sort of the overarching themes as I go through each of these. Um, so getting back to the chart um, assortment, um, and this is an easy one to think about because in store you've got a very finite space You've got the shelf and you've got a, a X amount of feet that you can deal with and work with, uh, where online it's just endless and there's just a lot of flexibility. Um, and you also have to think about fulfillment online when you're thinking about assortment, because there are definitely certain products when you sell, sell online that you have to understand how that product is going to get to the consumer. Um, pricing is another one in terms of the flexibility and the speed maintained maybe daily in store in brick and mortar and can be maintained by the minute in online. So very different. Um, promotion is very, very traditional for in store right now. We've got, you know, um, promotional um, tags in the shelf and, and so on, where in the uh, online world, there's again, just a lot of flexibility and opportunity uh, across the digital shelf. Merchandising, we work with planograms for in-store. We do not necessarily work with uh, specific planograms and we can make changes uh, very quickly online. Marketing is very traditional in-store. Um, when I think about digital uh, in-store capabilities, which are coming online um, more and more, it's still a very, very small percentage of digital uh, marketing in store, whereas online, uh, as I mentioned, it can be very personalized. Um, the product category definitions, which is really important to category management, uh, are very specific in the online, in the uh, in store world, and very solution focused uh, in e commerce. And then the terminologies are very different. So standard to CPG industry terminology for category management, um, whereas there's new language in terms of, you know, page views and clicks and, and search. So those are all new elements um, in terms of the terminology within the industry. So this just is just a very high overarching uh, 
thought about thinking about, you know, how the two are different as we think about the category management process. Thanks, Leslie. And uh, I'd love to just build on that, uh, if you don't mind, and talk a little bit about the underlying cause behind why those category management principles feel so different and why managing the online shelf um, feels almost like a world that's upside down compared to managing the brick and mortar shelf. At the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that it is algorithms that are driving the majority of online retailer uh, behavior that shoppers interact with rather than a category management or a category manager relationship where you're doing an annual or, or biannual planogram review and making merchandising decisions over the course of the year with that buyer at, at the respective retailer. Um, particularly when it comes to the search engine, but at the likes of Amazon, it could even go as far as things like funding negotiations. Increasingly, it's algorithms that need to be understood and um, influenced in order to have the same effects that traditional category management practices would have. And so when we think about that conversion that Leslie just took us through, um, a lot of that is driven by that very fact and understanding the drivers that influence search and the drivers that influence what shoppers ultimately see. Thank you, Danny and Leslie. I will now turn it over to Chris, who will share with everybody uh, how to best optimize uh, your online performance. You know, thanks, Rob. And, and honestly, what, what Leslie and Danny just talked about, I think, plays right into this. So it's a perfect tie in. You know, when you're working with an algorithm, um, maybe a more advanced algorithm with a lot less human intervention like Amazon or the ever evolving algorithm-based dashboards and platforms that we're working with with a lot of the traditional retailers that are now e-commercializing their businesses like the Walmarts of the world, Kroger's of the world. You know, ultimately, a lot actually sits in your control. Um, I mean, there's there's new challenges, but a lot sits in your control. And there are a lot of levers and triggers that you can, you can help influence to ultimately drive your business forward. And so while this is a rather busy strategic framework, it, it actually, I think, helps organize the ultimately the, the multitude of levers necessary to drive this new type of business forward now if we replicated this for brick and mortar as as mass and and you know large grocery was starting to um, emerge you know decades ago I mean we would have had something equally as as complex and 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 thoughtful in a framework but the difference here is that you know you're it is compound interest. Um, that you're building with every effort you make to kind of keep spinning this flywheel model. And and as Danny had on his slide, you know, that that historic Jeff Bezos on the back of a napkin flywheel model um, is what is driving that Amazon ecosystem forward at such a clip and, and is ultimately expediting a lot of the other retailers' reactions and responses in the marketplace. And they themselves have their own, I mean, Walmart has their own flywheel that they're evolving as they e-commercialize. And so for us as brands to win in this marketplace and thrive going forward, we have to have something similar that builds that same kind of compound momentum. And so we've, you know, based on many years and multiple minds um, from practitioner experience, this has kind of been a culmination of how to look at it at both an executive and a practitioner active activation level. And this just helps you see on the left side, the green is really that foundation all the different elements that go into setting up the right go-to-market approach. And then actually on the on the blue side is really bringing that to market and actually bringing that to life in front of the you know, client and customer. Um, but as you build that, you start to perform and drive data and drive, you know, and drive, you know, results. And those results, um, both, you know, you know, aspirationally high or just, you know, just to get started, are driving the momentum around both sides of help you build more of a foundation and build better and accelerate your activation. And so this becomes that infinity loop that you really want that that obviously if it, if it goes fast enough becomes unstoppable for you in your category. But th if you go to the next slide, Rob, th the way we kind of look at it here, I think is it's important to think through this mindset of customer lifetime value. And when I've talked to a lot of direct to consumer retailers and online retailer um, leaders um, of their brick and mortar counterparts, they're often thinking through these formulas of how to assess how they're doing, um, you know, how they're building um, their, 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 their brands and driving growth. And, and it's, they break it down, all those little levers that you had on that previous slide can actually be kind of segmented into 
levers that help drive each one of these macro pillars of growth, right? So traffic, conversion, average order size, and repeat rate, all, and, and, and again, everything blurs together. I mean, a promotion can drive traffic, but it also can be the conversion um, you know, trigger once someone is on the page. And so um, it also can help you build baskets. So each thing can have multiple roles, but it's important to think, hey, if I've got steady traffic, you know, traffic is unchanged, my average order size is strong, and my repeat rate for my category is, is average or above, if I start seeing my conversion rate going down, um, and I look at my business and measure it this way, I can start very quickly getting down to the micro level of what's really driving that. Is it that I ended a promotion? Is it that my items became unprofitable and had been dropped off of the retailer's website? Is it that my content is less relevant than my competitors? Have new players entered the digital shelf that are more competitive in pricing than, than mine? Um, have I gone out of stock? I mean, all of these things can be understood if you think of these levers along this formula. And so this can, again, these are just some frameworks to help people start organizing, but we started actually building out scorecards that helped help us start tracking each of the data points under each of these pillars. So we could, again, the same way that a direct to consumer retailer would be managing their business in, in part so that we could really get hone in on where the, the issues were, where the opportunities were, where the success was actually being realized so we could lean in. And so I think this can help a lot of you out there understand how to influence your business and, and accelerate it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, there's so much data available in e-commerce. How do I know which data points to focus on? Leslie, do you want to uh, kick us off in this section, please? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so really, um, you know, there definitely is the, the largest proportion of growth um, we're seeing is online right now, even if it's a small piece of the business, we're seeing the most growth in the online world. Um, but really understanding um, and, and evaluating what data and information is most relevant for driving your business online um, and why it's important is really, um, other than the growth, there are other reasons. And so, um, it's, it's really about understanding um, and, and creating, um, working with a needs assessment. So understanding for your e-commerce team, for your category management team, for your shopper insights team, what, what kinds of information do they need to really understand uh, what's happening online? Um, it's defining those measures, creating a plan uh, for what is needed to measure. Because there's so many different data sets right now that it's it can be very challenging to understand what is most important and so defining what you need and what is most important and prioritization is critical the other piece is that education and learning i mean there are so many different data sets that really understanding methodologies understanding the data that you're working with and the strengths and weaknesses is very important as well as continuously learning about new data sets because there are so many new things out there that um that you can use to measure um and then it becomes the tools so um once you decide what data sets um are most relevant for your business it really becomes uh, a question of what tools are you going to use uh, on top of those data sets and then it's really just iterating for this. So once you've decided and you've got data that you're using and it's and it's working for you and it's providing the insights that you need to run your business, it's really a matter of um, making sure that it continues to meet your objectives and to iterate on that because it's always changing. There's always new data sets that are coming up available uh, based on new technology all the time. So really it's, it's make it relevant, define what you want to, measure, educate yourself, and uh, be aware of the different tools that are out there. And, and Leslie, just to pick up on that last point too, um, by, my, by my estimates and experience, uh, e-commerce tends to move at a pace of about 10x versus uh, brick and mortar, traditional retail. And so those needs do constantly change um, from not only you know, your, your strategy and execution needing um, constant evaluation, but also the measurement, how you're measuring it, and making sure that you're getting as near real-time data as possible so that you can respond to what's working and do more of it and be 
be more efficient in areas that are not necessarily working. Um, just as a brief and somewhat shameless plug, that's uh, really the driving force behind the creation of Edge by Essential and bringing together the capabilities of strategy and insight support, market share reporting for performance, and digital shelf and price and performance measurement um, that are behind what drives traffic and conversion and ultimately your performance at the at the digital shelf. Um, so whether it's Edge or um, you know other providers in the space, what's most critical is that within your e-commerce stack, you have the data sets that you need that can give you as near real-time insight as possible to constantly optimize your business. And one thing I, I would add to what Danny said um, at, at a more, even more macro level that's been kind of an interesting development is we've heard from a lot of clients that we're working with that are global in, 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 in scope um, that, you know, some of the, again, I would say leading retailers outside of even the, the North America ecosystem are starting to talk to their partners, both brands and solution providers, agencies, other, um, other types of services about their their share of data what sh what data do you bring to the table and what share do you have and how we assess who we partner with and who's valuable to us so while market share will always in share of voice and obviously some of the traditional share metrics do matter and will continue to matter they may be informed by how much data you actually can capture for yourself and leverage and how fast you can leverage it so um, and how complementary you are to their ecosystems and so that's why I think you see a lot of you know, large CPGs, large consumer goods companies starting to obviously acquire in some cases or innovate outside of their traditional product categories, trying to find synergies and complementary capabilities that, that enable them to bring more to the marketplace than just more, more of the same product, even though that, that is why you know, obviously their original mission. And so um, share of data just should be very top of mind. Obviously, you want to make sure you have the right data and you got to get down into the actual nitty gritty. But that share of data could ultimately be what makes or breaks, you know, an organization in the future of commerce. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next question, uh, really the million dollar question, and I'll let Danny uh, kick us off here. How do I build the business case to invest in e-commerce capabilities? Yeah, thanks, Robin. And the question behind the question here really is, at the end of the day, how do I sell in e-commerce when e-commerce direct revenue can seem relatively low compared to the investment that's required to really optimize there? It is a fast growing channel, but for most brands and retailers, it still represents a smaller piece of the business. Um, and so what we talk to our clients about is really focusing on three things. First of all, particularly when in front of a, um, a brand partner, a brand marketer, um, talking about protecting brand equity. So much of that offline and online sales, but even the offline conversion starts with those online interactions and making sure that all of that money and time invested in creating great brands um, carries over into the online retailer environment uh, in the form of correct and up-to-date images, titles, and um, feature bullets that are, are proper and, and up-to-date um, and reflect really the best of what the brand wants to have out there in the market. If you don't have the investment and focus on e-commerce, ultimately the brands will not be properly represented online. Number two, along the same lines, winning offline starts with winning online. If you're not capturing the attention of the shopper in the online environment, you're far less likely to convert them at the physical shelf. And finally, um, as long as I've been in e-commerce, well over a decade at this point, I've often been asked, you know, should I invest in e-commerce or am I just cannibalizing myself? At the end of the day, there really isn't a choice. This is not about what we on, as a brand or as a retailer want to do. It's about following the shopper, a point that Leslie made earlier in the webcast. Shopper behavior is changing. They are going online, their search their, and research starts online increasingly. And brands who don't follow them and retailers who don't follow them and follow that path to purchase will be left behind um, and it will be captured by those who do understand and are, are um, pivoting their, their behavior and practices to how the shopper behaves today. And, and I would just add to what Danny said, because he made th those three points are so critical. I mean, if you just play forward a couple years here with the evolving role of the physical store, more and more stores are trying to build experiences and become showrooms and discovery centers, but also realize that they need that footprint for e-commerce fulfillment out of the back of their stores. And so obviously it's a finite space. So over time, certain categories are going to get squeezed and they're going to get reduced. And, and, and so 
you know, and, and maybe there will only be one facing of each item in certain categories. And so ultimately what's going to dictate those planograms is going to be what is most popular and where do you think some of that data will ultimately come from? So this really reinforces point number two, off, winning offline will actually be informed by who won online because they'll want to know what brands they should be stocking. And again, that goes back to digitally native brands who wouldn't have been stocked in a planogram, um, wouldn't have been shelved to begin with because they didn't have any history or any you know national level data, but online, it starts giving people an indication of what's trending and winning and what, what should be carried to obviously win those those baskets with a smaller center store. So um, it, it just, online really will become the trigger of offline because offline will be, how do I in, how do I engage the shopper and occasionally fulfill some of those ca you know, category needs that aren't still you know, shopped for online. So it's, it's gonna be, we're gonna see that paradigm shift. Th thanks, Danny and Chris. And Leslie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you right now uh, to share with us winning in the future and um, key organizational investment areas. Thanks. Yeah, so um, we put this together um, when we were doing uh, some research on looking at organizations and how they're um, structured and what we see the future uh, in the future, how organizations need to think about structure. Um, and really, it's 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 about uh, data and analytics, really having the right information because we're just more and more very data driven uh, because there's so much information out there, we should be informed. Um, it's about the analytics behind the data and really investing in um, people that can use the data and know how to, to make it work. Um, and then to that end, it's about people. So um, we think that, you know, organizations who are the winning organizations are those that really invest in their people uh, and have the right folks in the right place. Um, the storytelling piece, we all talk about, um, you know, joint business planning with the retailer and working together collaboratively. And you got to be able to have a really good story. And I actually, this, this bucket here, I had presentation and I changed it to storytelling because I do believe, um, even though it is sort of a term that's, often used nowadays, the storytelling term, I believe that is true, that you really need to be able to make your case um, in your planning and really understand uh, and be able to articulate what is what is happening. Uh, when you've got the data and the analytics, you need the right tools. Um, and so it's, again, goes back to um, evaluating what types of data you need, but also what tools are important. And then the education thing is very, um, to me, this is one of my favorite um, areas because I think it's so critical with the data, data overload and um, everything that's going on in the industry and all the change that we're under, you really need to invest in continuing education for um, the, the various functions across the organization, including Catman, Shopper Insights, everything's changing so fast that you just need to keep that education up. So it's really education, education for the organization as well as the individual. And, and I would add, let Leslie and, and I and Danny had talked about this in prep. Those six, those six are so important and education kept always coming back up, you know, in, in some of the organizations I've been a part of what we would always ask, you know, just, we felt like we were over-educating, like we, we didn't know what else we could possibly do and what, what doesn't seem to be a true aha moment, but really was, um, you, you know, I know Leslie would support this, is the, the fact that you can educate all day long, but if someone's actual incentive or direction or performance goals don't include a specific call out to change their behavior, you're only going to get, so you're only going to get that first early adopter um, and kind of the, you know, the innovator um, group within your organization and likely to be fair you probably are those people so we probably got most of those people through inspiration and general education and it really comes down to a little bit of um, you know kind of a little bit of a push from this is what you're allowed to do you're allowed to change your behavior now um, and that obviously has to come both kind of bottoms up but really tops down it has to be it has to cascade down through performance goals and, and through KPIs that people are held to achieving. Um, but, but you have to have that education first, because obviously the education probably needs to be directed up at the executive group so that they make those changes that then inform new behavior. 
Good points. Yes, that's exactly right. I, it really has to come from the top. The organizational structure has to support the continuing education and working together. And and really, um, as part of that, when we think about um, uh, those key areas for winning in, in today's world, um, we see some explosion in uh, of importance in shopper insights as well as e-commerce um, expertise. Um, those are sort of critical areas um, for organizations to invest in um, uh, to drive growth. You really need these these uh, this expertise. Um, along with that, it's really the data scientists and the CRM experts. So making sure that the organization is investing in those areas as well to understand opportunities within the category, within the brands. Um, and then for getting more specific, going back to category management, um, planogram automation is, is a key as well. There's so many new tools and platforms out there that um, it's not necessary in today's world anymore um, to be doing uh, planograms in a very manual way. Uh, it really should be automated because there's so many different tools out there. Um, to help companies save time. Data, data visualization, again, a very often used term, but I really do believe that bringing the insights to life can be done with the right um, data visualization software. Um, and then really the Centers for Excellence, we talk to a lot of companies and it's, it's really making sure that you are on top of the technology changes that are happening, understanding all the different things, voice commerce, car commerce, um, you know, fulfillment options, uh, in-store technology, online technology, just really making sure that you have a center of excellence so that you as an organization understand what is out there and what is possible. And then we talked about the education and training. It's really um, continuous learning. And, and, and as Chris said, having support from the structure of your organization um, and the leadership. I think those are really key areas to invest in. Hey, thank you very much, Leslie, Danny, and Chris. And that concludes uh, today's uh, panel component of today's presentation. Um, Great insights, Leslie, Danny, and Chris. Uh, thank you very much. We've now entered uh, the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, all participants are on mute for the call, um, but if you do have any questions, uh, please do uh, send them in. And if we are unable uh, to answer them live, we will make sure to get back to you immediately. And yes, the first question uh, that came in, um, Yes, all participants and uh, attendees will receive a copy of the uh, recording. Uh, and again, uh, apologies on our end uh, for the technical difficulties, but we will make sure uh, to get that to you uh, promptly. Uh, first question, again, we've had many questions come in, so thank you everybody for your engagement and participation. Uh, the first question, Chris, I'll pose to you. Um, it looks like a great one for you, seeing as you were the member of this panel who most recently worked with the CPG and Kellogg's. Uh, how can e-commerce teams, Chris, wrestle resources and budget from bricks and mortar teams? That That is, um, I think, the that, that's a loaded question, um, but but it, it comes with a lot of passion on my side, having been you know across multiple companies public private small large categories more advanced categories much further behind in terms of development um i, I would say it kind of goes to some of what we've talked about why invest but it, it's telling the right story but with a data-driven foundation to your story um but but really it's trying to challenge the status quo from i would say you know arguably 20 different angles and and constantly rereading each each key stakeholder to to make that argument because again you're not we all want money and resources for our businesses whether we're on brick and mortar or club or dollar or e-commerce or mass and you know there's always an opportunity and we always want more you know to drive our business forward but taking ourselves out of it if you actually just start looking at apples to apples and challenging the status quo with data i mean looking at dollars per employee as an example of teams you know um growth dollars per employee you could start making things apples to apples to show just how disproportionate the e-commerce team in many cases is being resourced compared to you know obviously the brick and mortar world 
and and really not again not not to knock the brick and mortar world because we still need them and that that while the role will change brick and mortar still is very important to the the future of commerce that the reality is you, you could start telling stories around well you know and i and i can say this from personal experience where literally our I, I was in a business where each of the small team of us made up you know upwards of 10 percent of the business retail sales versus the brick and mortar teams which individually made up one percent and that was on a category that was a lot more developed where the e-commerce business was very large um i mean i mean right there i mean yes we're very very productive but we, we, we could definitely use more resources than the single digit number of, of, of team members we had. And so um, some of the other things, you know, and, and I think Danny mentioned this earlier, was, was around, you know, when, when you're looking at the P&L and the resources, sometimes your e-commerce P&L can look upside down because you've got a lot more dollars and people against this small developing business that's not quite that large yet. But what really needs to be considered too is holding the brick and mortar world and PLs accountable to a like for like treatment. And I won't go too, too far into this, but what I would say is, you know, national media that, that, a, that a company runs isn't necessarily being applied universally against the national retailers that the majority of sales are going through. So if you had that traditional TV and now much, much larger digital and social budget that might be influencing 40% of your Walmart business, that's not sitting on a lot of the Walmart P&Ls. So it's really not apples to apples to say that the Amazon, you know, advertising that you do, that, that influences a much larger digital, you know, shopper beyond the Amazon sales themselves should only sit on the Amazon P&L when you could consider that national in scope as well. So, I mean, you know, we could get into a debate on specifics, but the point is at, at a macro principle based level we need to be holding everyone accountable and trying to show the, the that story in an apple to apples way and again at the end of the day data can help um what i will say just one last little point that always helped me and this this goes back to um a a, a comment that spencer millerberg um who was the founder of one click retail one of the four companies that made that now makes up edge said to me when i was uh, we actually go way back and he was my buyer actually at amazon at, when we were at wreck it um but he he said, you know, Chris, you know, it, it's a Bible verse, but, you know, you can't be a prophet in your own land. And so I learned that very early on that I needed to bring outside perspective in. It could be from peers, um, you know, in the industry, it could be from solution providers. But sometimes hearing the very same thing from someone else, um, even if it was just as data backed as you had it, can move the needle a little bit further with someone else because it's a little less threatening as an outside stakeholder looking in. And so um, I definitely push people, you know, join share groups, go to events, talk to other people, bring back decks from other people, invite them to come speak to your leadership or to key stakeholders, get them on a call. Sometimes those little bits of outside influence can make a huge difference. And so, um, so again, data, apples to apples comparison and outside, uh, outside stakeholders can, can really move the needle in getting resources shifted to your business. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Leslie, a question just came in for you. Uh, from a retailer standpoint, how can retailers best work with manufacturers to ensure that both parties can mutually reap the rewards of e-commerce while working together? Oh, great question. Thanks, Chris. I mean, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And actually, um, a category management association, we've, we've um, actually defined a collaborative plan in our ECL report, that's our um, e-commerce category leadership white paper. And we've thought a lot about this. And um, so we've actually put together a process um, that can be followed that really helps to ensure collaboration. And uh, it's a five-step process and I won't go into a lot of detail on it, but just to kind of give you an overview, um, the five steps are define, discover, design, develop, and deliver. Um, and really just real quickly defining really is is about having a kickoff meeting, aligning to objectives, uh, category definitions, the vision, all of those things. Um, and once that's done, it's really discover. And discovering is is all about the insights, the data, the insights, the shopper, um, and exploring different strategies. And once you've done that with your retail partner, then it's about um, strategy finalization like a strategy workshop um and a tactic workshop really do well to partner with the retailer 
um, and, and, and together plan for what that's going to look like and how you're going to move forward and grow the business. Um, and that's then just delivering um, and executing on a plan, um, creating a scorecard and reviewing the scorecard um, is important. And uh, so that's really the steps that you want to think about as you're collaborating uh, manufacturer and retailer. It's it's defining what, you, what your goals are. It's discovering through insights. It's designing the program strategically and tactically um, and developing that program and then delivering those um, the execution and then measuring your your results um, and i think if you follow the process if you think about those key areas and you agree to work together in those buckets i think that really helps a lot in um, delivering growth thank you leslie um, and another question that came in again many so very appreciative of everybody's uh, engagement and uh, sending through questions uh, danny a question came in for you uh, where are you seeing brands start when they look to start or accelerate their e-commerce operations yeah you know the the end of the day the number one place to start is looking at your out of stocks there is nothing that is going to accelerate your sales faster and is more within your ability to influence and control um, that will immediately show progress and results to your organization um, and so even if you are a a, a team of one or two and you're trying to figure out how do we get some quick wins on the board we always say start with your out of stocks and improving those and cleaning up that overall availability um, and assortment uh, from there there's the beautiful basics that go into it having the right products that are set on the shelf um, and making sure that those right products have the right contents so that the products are discoverable um, by shoppers those are really, you know, those basic fundamentals to get started with. From there, um, if you're looking to expand and think about, well, what do I need beyond the basics? The next place to focus really is on content. Um, content requires a dedicated focus from the e-commerce team, trying to retask what marketing provides uh, from traditional marketing assets or digital marketing assets um, will often leave you shorthanded. It won't get you the types of pr uh, product images you need or the type of copy that is optimized for an e-commerce environment. Um, I like to say, think about um, talking to somebody at a party versus trying to sell something in the aisle of a grocery store. You would use different language, and that's the difference between website copy and e-commerce copy. So having somebody who can focus on securing assets and writing proper copy is going to be the next port of call once you get those fundamentals in place. Thank you very much, uh, Dini, Chris, and Leslie. Uh, that's all the time we have today for questions. Uh, so again, anybody that asked a question that we did not get to, um, we will absolutely uh, make sure uh, to get back to you. So thank you again for asking questions. Um, moving on, uh, Edge uh, will be attending uh, this year uh, Category Management and Shopper Insights Conference uh, coming up. Um, really excited to attend. Leslie, do you want to share with everybody uh, some of the uh, some of the details on the event and if they're interested in joining, how they go about uh, attending, uh, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's going to be a great show this year. We've got about um, half of the conference is going to be um, dedicated to shopper insights and other uh, grouping is category management. We've got a lot of e-commerce as part of, as part of our um, uh, content that we're going to be sharing. Uh, if you're interested in going, just um, head, head to the web, website at catman.global and uh, you can see all the details there. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a fabulous conference. It's February 25th, 26th and 27th and it is in Las Vegas. Great. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, I also we also wanted to share we also wanted to share with everybody. Uh, in addition to our virtual our virtual webcast, uh, we also have an awesome schedule of in person events and programs that we want to share with you uh, here with Edge. Um, two of those exciting opportunities. The first, uh, we'd like to invite you to our two advanced retail strategy programs in partnership with UCLA Anderson Executive Education on March 19th and 20th on campus in Los Angeles, and also with NYU Stern Executive Education on May 29th and 30th on campus in New York City. Uh, these are both exclusive two-day immersion programs for brand and retail leaders across functions taught by leading UCLA, Anderson School of Management business professors, edge advisors, and industry practitioners that provides the perfect blend of theory and application to analyze and operationalize the latest strategies critical to winning the future of commerce. Second, we are hosting two e-hackathons in the U.S., which are full-day e-commerce masterclass summits 
dedicated to winning on Amazon.com. We have our e-hackathon Bentonville on March 26th focused on winning with Walmart and our e-hackathon New York City on April 16th focused on winning with Amazon. There are limited seats uh, for both events and early bird tickets are available now. You can either reach out to your edge partner or register directly via our website, essentialedge.com, uh, where it's listed under the events tab. Um, so those are two opportunities uh, to um, attend in-person sessions uh, in addition to our virtual webcast calendar. So with that, uh, we'd, we'd like to thank uh, Danny, Chris, and Leslie uh, for their time today. And uh, again, we'd like to say thank you uh, to everybody who attended. Um, we apologize again for the technical difficulties. We will make sure to uh, send today's presentation uh, to all those who attended. Um, if, you, uh, if you'd like to learn more about Edge and, and how we can help you along uh, you know, this e-commerce journey and just this um, uh, way of navigating this cloudy uh, retail landscape, future retail landscape, uh, you can contact us today at info at essentialedge.com or again by visiting our website at essentialedge.com to learn more. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Leslie, uh, do you want to just share with everybody um, if they're interested in learning more about the CMA and Chopper Insights organization, um, the best way to go about doing that? Yeah, um, we've got the, the uh, information here on the slide. We've got member services at cpgcatnet.org. That is our head of member services, Diane, and she is awesome, and she can help. Any any information that you're looking for or any um, questions that you have, she will be able to help you. And then, like I said before, catman.global is the website, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you very much, Leslie. And uh, with that, that concludes today's presentation. Uh, again, thank you uh, to everybody who joined the call. Uh, again, apologies for the uh, technical issues on our side. We'll make sure uh, to, uh, to send this to you immediately. And uh, again, would absolutely love to uh, uh, work with you further and uh, you know, help you with any issues that you may have uh, moving forward. Uh, so again, thank you, everybody. Have a great day and look forward to speaking with everybody soon.